Welcome to the Mindful Millennial Podcast, where host Seth Marcus dissects and discusses all things impacting the millennial mind. Mentors, peers, and professionals share intimate conversations on subjects such as entrepreneurship, exercise, and health, the blessings and curses of technology, travel, and how to navigate adulthood in this age of information. We're the largest generation in history, and we dictate the future. The Mindful Millennial finds a signal through the noise. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mind Mill Podcast. As I record this introduction, I am in Santa Monica, California, visiting a few close friends and building new content for the show. I've also been building a new project that I'm really excited to share with you, but more to come on that in the next few months. Those of you that know me or follow the show know that I've been on the move a lot this year. In 2018, I've spent more nights in foreign lands than in my own bed. This year is a trial to experience a genuine traveler's lifestyle. Can I work while traveling? Can I maintain balance? Can I achieve my goals? Can I not only maintain my projects, but can they excel? I've learned so much about myself during this process, and with a few months remaining in this year, I can safely say that I am burned out on travel. I feel so blessed to have the opportunities to see the world, but now it's time to nest, to shift inward and to recharge. I'm sure a lot of us feel the same way after a long summer. It's just natural. So today I encourage everyone to take a deep breath and just be grateful for this precious life we all share and check in on what's serving you and what is not. Today's episode is with Tyrone Beverly, and I'm very excited to share his story with you. Tyrone is an entrepreneur, a community leader, yoga teacher, family man, inspirer, and unifier. His extreme passion for equality, human rights, unity, and physical and social health has kickstarted a wellness movement that unites communities and fosters healthy lifestyles across the nation. He is the founder and executive director of I'm Unique, a yoga program which combines elements of Tai Chi and Eastern philosophy. Tyrone brings his programs all over the country, focusing on bringing yoga and social unity to people of all ages, cultures, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Him and his team have conquered some amazing feats, including opening up dialogue between gang members and police officers through yoga, through shared meals, and a safe place to communicate. Tyrone finds his yoga venues in an array of places, from a cleared out section of a Walmart to the Arise Music Festival, where I met him earlier this summer. His class was so unique and empowering, I had to invite him onto the show and get to know him better. Tyrone's story is fascinating, his mission noble, and his movement growing. I'm honored to have Tyrone Beverly on this episode of The Mind Mill. Be sure to stick around after the interview for Tyrone's reading of his Poetic Flow, a truly moving and powerful poem that encompasses the passion, integrity, and connection to body and mind. Enjoy. Tyrone Beverly, welcome to The Mind Mill. How are you doing, man? Oh, not too bad. Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. I met Tyrone a few weeks ago at the Arise Music Festival where he was teaching and I was performing and I just it was the highlighted yoga class of the weekend. And I <laughs> just wanted to appreciate you again and say thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you for participating and showing up. Whenever you do the yoga festivals, you get a whole different variety of different flavors of yoga and something about yours has really captivated me at least. I don't know if you remember this. I told you that day, like there was a guy who had been partying all weekend towards the end of our class. Everybody was so united and in such a great mood. And I went back to my mat after one of our group exercises. And this guy was on so many drugs sitting pretty much on my mat. <laughs> and I had, to, <laughs> I, had a, I had a very real challenge of keeping myself in that yogic space while uh, he was making weird comments and trying to drum up conversations with people in Shavasana. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that conversation, actually. (laughs) Glad you were able to uh, get past that. (laughs) One thing I noticed about your class was that it had a lot of poetry and a little bit of martial arts or a Tai Chi sort of influence to it. Am I right with that? Yeah, you can say that. Definitely the poetry. And I mean, I think there's always been a, a interest in Kung Fu and I take some of those elements and combine the two. So I think there can be something that would definitely um, link the two. Did you find yoga first or was the, kind of the Kung Fu martial arts in your radar beforehand? Since I can remember, I grew up watching Bruce Lee and Van Damme and all those guys who really focused on martial arts. And I've always found it to be really intriguing that someone cultivates their intelligence to be able to manipulate their body in different ways and manipulate their mind in different ways to benefit their life. So for me, Kung Fu was my initial starting point 
and not saying I was practicing Kung Fu, but it was just the films and the movies that I would see and people being able to perform different things on screen and being able to apply that to real life made a lot of sense to me. So that's where a lot of the interest came from. Did you study it as a kid? Did you go to classes or do karate when you were growing up? I didn't do anything until I got older, until I became an adult, actually. I never went to any kung fu classes or any martial arts classes, but when I became an adult, I ended up going to China and going to Wudong and spending time with the kung fu masters and the tai chi masters and just being able to be in an environment where you see it being a lifestyle. It wasn't about like fighting what people always think, but it was more so just about the lifestyle. I had seen people who were in their late 90s carrying buckets it's a water up and down hills on their own with no crutches and that was intriguing because I feel like in our society today we're falling apart at really young ages and what are we doing wrong to not be able to do that when we get older to be able to gracefully age I find that to be one of the most important things that we can do in life not saying that you're going to live forever but you can do it gracefully yeah so I was wondering did you notice it in from like the dietary side of things or complete philosophy and mentality, kind of strong mind, strong body. Where did you notice in China that gave these men and women such longevity? I think it was more so the consistency that it was a lifestyle. It was everything that they did. It wasn't one particular thing, but it was something to where they apply all of these principles to the daily regimen so whatever you're doing it wasn't just dietary it wasn't just exercise it was more so what am I doing every single day and that's what I was able to see and I can only interpret from my experience and it might be something different but I've seen people who were really active in a different way when I was in Wudong people took the time to be patient and to do daily tasks and eat together and live together and garden together and do a lot of things that I haven't seen here as a collective in the states together So that was something that I found to be um, appealing. I would imagine that's what brought you to this kind of community-based yoga and the classes that you put together. I actually started practicing yoga before I went to China, though. When I think about community now, I no longer think about, sometimes people say a yoga community or the Pilates community or the volleyball community or the sports community or the whatever kind of community. And there's a lot of silos and there's a lot of division. So for me, a real community is where all of those groups are actually functioning together harmoniously. So when I say the word community, I don't use it loosely. I mean people who may have a different alignment than I do, but we're all in the same environment. And I think that's what a community really is. And it's not just to be broken up in silos and segregated, which we've been doing for so long. So when I say community, I'm talking about an array of people from all different walks of life that come together and try to do our best to coexist. Well put, man. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I appreciate that. (laughs) Something that I noticed a lot from traveling earlier this year and then coming back is the sense of being so connected through social media, yet so disconnected from our neighbors, Mm -hmm. from the people next to us in a yoga class, people next to us on the subway. It's turning into an epidemic. Mm -hmm. It's easier to dive back into busy work or the illusion of busyness than that little nudge to say hi to a stranger or to make a new friend. And that's what I really appreciated about your class more than anything else is realizing that we're not all that different Mm. and we all like being happy and we're all vulnerable. Yeah. That was, uh, I think the highlight of my experience with your class was towards the end of a Sunday, the last day of the festival, getting us all, all our stinky bodies all together (laughs) about as close. You wouldn't let us stay that far apart. You kept me like, nope, closer, nope, closer, nope, closer. And it was, it was just one sweaty, happy family for for the last 15 minutes of that class. That was actually the beginning of a, of a really, really special day for me of a lot of those relationships kind of coming around through the people I met during the music or at tents, just these kind of serendipitous occurrences of meeting new amazing people that are now kind of in my life. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. And I appreciate that. So you were doing your yoga training and you decided that going to China was your next logical step or was it just a a trip that you always wanted to do? What was the calling to get to? uh, Is Wudong the area or is Wudong the practice? Actually, um, if you've ever seen the movie Karate Kid with Jaden Smith, I, I saw the first one. Well, you got to see. I think it was a uh, came out in 2010, I believe, with Jaden Smith. And there's a the lady remake. with a snake and people all over practice kung fu. 
and Tai Chi all day, every day, literally. And that's what you see in the movie. And when you go out there, that's exactly what's happening. They're practicing Kung Fu, Qigong all day, every single day. And I was always interested in going to China, but the way I went to China was from invitation. I had a relationship with someone who wanted to bring me out there with them. And then that's how that all came together. So it wasn't something that I put together and I was like, oh, I'm about to go to China. It was something that happened. You talk about these just things occurring. I met a guy, his name is Chen, and he's one of the masters from China. He's an ambassador and he was out here momentarily. And I met him in maybe, let's say September, and we ended up leaving like a month or a half after that. <laughs> so it was something that was uh, organically that just came together. Fell into place. Yeah, so that's kind of how that all happened. So it wasn't something I thought about doing. I thought about doing it in my life, but it wasn't something I had planned on doing it in that way. It sure. just organically happened. So I grew up doing martial arts. My father got me into it. It was a kind of our little bonding because I was into the kung fu movies yeah. too, you know. I, you know I, wanted, I, I wanted to wrestle with my friends yeah. in the backyard and, and show them my moves, break some boards, yeah. you know. It kind of fell off. A lot of the principles have stuck with me into adulthood, but just the practice of martial arts is well into my past. Hmm. I have a huge respect for it. What did you notice from coming from the yoga world to China and seeing these similar yet different mindfulness routines and practices to connect body and mind. What did you notice as far as the similarities and differences? Uh, what I noticed, it was more of um, the culture took it on in Wudong. So it wasn't just a school, but it was the entire culture. The whole environment was conducive to cultivating your abilities. So that was something that I've seen out there that I haven't seen out here as far as like the entire community being involved. Whether you worked at the grocery store, or wherever you worked at, you had a connection to it as well. So that was something that was really beautiful. It was a smaller population, obviously, but the people were all on the same accord. And you see a lot of young people practicing on their own. And that was something I appreciated because out here we have to go into different schools and try to convince them that this is something that our youth should be doing whereas out there the youth were doing it on their own and being guided by those who they were around as well so that was something i feel like we can learn from and be able to apply to our environments as well so what have been your more successful versus less successful attempts at bringing these communities together because you seem to be such a unifier i'm wondering was it quick success or was there a kind of a trial and error period i'm sure you're still in that to a certain, <laughs> yeah i'm still, a I'm, about to say, I'm still in that trial yeah. and error period earlier on in my journey with the yoga practice i went into different environments and i tried to get facilities to open up their doors to be able to have an asana practice for free for different people in the community and there was a lot of doors that were being shut and people were saying no we can't do that here it's not of interest and i just kept knocking i just kept knocking i kept knocking and eventually those doors opened up to where we ended up having the most diverse yoga class in all of colorado and that was something that was years of cultivation and years of knocking and seeing those again and again and again and no, realizing that, you know, once you have 100 no's, that 101 might be that yes that you need. And I think that's what happened over time. And people from all walks of life began to come to the asana practice with us. And I think that was something that we can all learn from is you have to just keep knocking at whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. But there was many barriers and there's still barriers, but now it's more so not really focusing on practicing asana, but just practicing everything in life, practicing speech, practicing the way you eat, practicing the way you think and realizing where the information in your mind comes from and being able to self-evaluate and being able to self-examine who you are as an individual, no matter where you come from and just realizing that most of our problems in life are social. If you're not connected socially, there's a lot of barriers. And if you learn how to see the world differently, it's a tool that can help you get through anything. And it's all about perception. So oftentimes we struggle with our perceptions. And so the barrier is a perception as well. So just kind of talking about what you were saying, I think a lot of that really comes from my own perception. Now, if I think it's a challenge or a barrier, it's because I've created it or I can just keep knocking until the yes comes. Mm -hmm. Did you have to overcome a lot of your own barriers to become the presenter, the teacher that you are now? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of lessons along the way. So when I first started teaching, 
there was a lot of different <laughs> experiences that I had. I come from a place where yoga was not well received. People had no idea what it was when I first started. I came from a community where it was gangs and it was drugs and it was violence. And then I'm over here practicing yoga moves and people are looking like, man, what happened? Are you, you know, they asking kind of questions. Does he still like girls or what's going on with him? And over time, I go into a classrooms and there was a lady who looked me up and down and she says, are you teaching? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And after she looked me up and down and I said, yes, ma'am, I am, she walked out. She came back a little later and she apologized and she said, I have a background where, you know, she wasn't connected to people who didn't look like her and to be led by someone who did not look like her was not in her, not in her card. So hmm. she felt like it wasn't for her. So she walked out and she apologized because she was dealing with a lot of prejudices that she'd been raised with. And earlier on, that was, it could have been a challenge, but I came with the open mind saying that there's going to be different people in this world who may not want to practice, who may not see it the same way, who may want to be divided and stick with their own kind. You have to let them be who they are. And if they come to the light, then that's okay too. And I think that was something I had to learn earlier on in my practice. Well, you have the much more challenging goal of bringing together a group of very diverse people who aren't into yoga. I'm sure you see so many first timers or very timid practitioners and a lot of the yoga community here in Colorado are a bit more affluent. They go to the same studios. They see that they are the same teachers. It's, it's just on their rotation. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I th think that there's something to be said about holding a chair pose or a warrior pose longer than you have before as that sort of comfort challenge. And it's a totally different experience to go to a, a Walmart and practice with people who don't have mats, don't have any yoga clothes, don't know anything about linking with their breath. It's a totally different animal. Mm -hmm. And it's also so incredibly important, I think, to go back to the social side of community and breaking those barriers. Within the last 50 years, like music and dance brought so many people together, especially dance. You know, you look back and there was just, there was such a communal celebration was hinged around dance and a lot of it is physical touch and it doesn't have to have a sexual connotation or any sort of agenda it was about expressing yourself physically i think we've lost that in the last 50 years hmm. for that reason practices like acro yoga and classes like yours where you're kind of pushed into that position where you need to have a conversation with a stranger or make physical contact with a stranger, even, even if it's as much as putting your arm around their shoulder for a, a shared balancing pose right. or these little things are foreign and they make people squirm a bit. I know that I started that way when I was first getting into yoga, I was like, Oh man, I don't want to rely on this person, but put them up on my feet or, you know, <laughs> anything like that. Yeah. And now depending on the day, that still is a little bit of a challenge, but I recognize You've been through that process so many times that you're like, this is something that will feel great. This is something that is important to to share with others. Hmm. And it truly does bring people together, man. And I, I really appreciate you facilitating that. Thank you. I think that a lot of the entrepreneurs and the, the starters out there in the community right now, essentially that's what they're trying to do is connect people by different means, you know, mm. whether it's through a yoga class or through a social media, a new app or a podcast, yeah. whatever it may be, it's about connection. Mm. And we need that in our communities now more than ever. It just feels like such a divided time right now. Mm. And I think a lot of that is the things that we tap into are feeding us that information that there is so much hate out there when there's in reality, there's just so much love that yeah. they like to sweep that under the rug just as a collective. I'm not quite sure why that happens. It seems like the larger the cities, the larger the quote communities, the harder it is to carve out a small community inside of that mm. through shared belief and a shared experience. Mm. So I wanted to ask you about your screen free days. Cause when I first reached out to you, it hit me back like a, a day later saying, I just put my phone away for the, for the day to spend time with the family. Yeah. Something I respect so much. And I just, I just was wondering, you know, what's, what is your screen free day? What do you like to do on those days? So I recently, well, I didn't recently have my, my significant other had a baby. I happen to be the father of that baby. And being able to spend time with him is something that I really enjoy doing. Just seeing him grow up and he's eight months now. So 
having those times where we can just watch each other watch me grow watch him grow watch her grow and we just occupy the same space doing nothing or just laughing or just keeping it simple going for a walk not doing too much but just spending that time together whatever that time may be whatever we're doing in that time that's uh, what i find to be really important when i'm just not doing too much and then being able to just strengthen the family unit by just being in each other's presence do you guys like to uh, cook together do you guys have a any like kind of budding budding family uh, traditions <laughs> we like to cook together sometimes it's not as uh, easy as it used to be the time is so challenging when you have full schedules but whenever we have the time or we whenever we make the time we definitely make sure that we can do that together eat together so we eat together every night and that's one of our traditions is we don't eat alone we don't eat this person not in this room this person's in that room we sit down at the table discuss our days uh, what we've been through and what we plan for it's not saying that we can predict the future but we can plan for it so we're talking about ideas that we plan for and that's something that we do on a daily so it's just being actively engaged in the relationship to be able to spend those subtle moments together my journal that i use has little inspirational quotes every day mm -hmm. and one that's been sticking with me over and over again is i think it's from eisenhower it said that plans are nothing but planning is everything mm -hmm. It's amazing how how quickly we derail when <laughs> when our plan falls apart. You know, right. when when somebody's twenty minutes late, and all of a sudden everybody's everybody's in a in a hiccup. You know what I mean? Yeah. But collecting and seeing what's happened in the last day, in the last week, in the last month, how are we going to stay on the path, or how are we going to change our playbook a little bit? Yeah. To, to keep going towards that goal, just kind of seeing what's working, see what doesn't, mm -hmm. just making those audibles along the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing your this uh, I'm Unique nonprofit program? Well, the inception of it was a lot longer, but it was official in 2013. So since 2013. Okay. So when all the paperwork was all legit. Yeah, <laughs> it always takes a lot longer, you but know? It, yeah, it was a lot longer than that, but um, that's when the paperwork was all. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research myself, but would you mind kind of explaining what, what it's based on? So I'm Unique, the mission of I'm Unique is to create a culture of health, individual growth, and social change. So you deal with the individual, and then you deal with the social. And I think those are the things that we need to do because culture influences behavior. So if we're not creating a culture of health, then we're going to continue to keep spinning our wheels and not really addressing the issues in our society that need to be changed. So being able to rethink and redesign a culture to live in, to grow in, and by design, it will change the society we live in. So those are some of the things that we work on. And we do yoga classes, and we also have a program called Breaking Bread, Breaking Barriers. It's where yeah. we have conversations with people who tend to disagree on certain subjects. So we're bringing in law enforcement with people who disagree with law enforcement and talk about police relations and police brutality and bring people to the table who don't like police officers. I hate police officers. And then this person doesn't feel connected to the community. And we grab those groups of people and we practice asana first. And then we dive into deeper conversations and seeing what we can do as individuals to make those relationships better. So we're not just saying, oh, this person's fault, this person's fault, this person's fault. But what can we individually do to create some of the changes that we want to see? And then we have a meal and we have conversation. And we've done that many different times. And it's always been really successful. At first, it was really tense because people have never really been in conversation with officers in that way and some of the officers never been in the conversation in that way and the yoga practice the asana practice allowed them to just be more patient to really focus on their breathing and then engage in those important conversations and at the end you see people crying people shaking hands taking pictures on social media talking about why can't we do this on a consistent basis to make this normalize in our communities to really improve those relationships and that's something that we've seen again and again and again and then we also have a program called karma tuesdays and that means on tuesdays we go out and we give back into the community or we invest into the community so say for instance there are some people who live on the streets who may not have food and we surveyed the community for a while and one thing that we found out is they say you know we need food sometimes we need clothes sometimes but one of the hardest things to come by is fresh water 
So we went and got a whole bunch of fresh water and then we've done that for a couple of years and then Lululemon got involved this year and they purchased hundreds of bottles, reusable bottles of water. So we passed out fresh bottles of water to people that they can continue to keep reusing in those bottles, keep it cold or keep it hot so they can use it throughout the year. And that's something that they can have. And we've seen people taking showers with this water, washing their bodies up and drinking this water because they were thirsty. So being able to be a resource for the community in that way and being able to go into different corporations. So maybe someone is stressed out or maybe someone lost a loved one and being able to bring people together to love on them in different ways and that's how Karma Tuesday shows up. And it's not something that we do where we have to highlight everything we do. You don't have to post it on social media. It's just saying on Tuesdays, let's get together and make someone's day better. Sometimes we can post it on social media, but sometimes we just keep it to ourselves and just keep it moving and build that into the culture of our existence to be able to invest in other people's lives along the way. Beautiful, man. I didn't know about the Karma Tuesday. <laughs> I saw about the breaking bread. Do you mind explaining a little bit about the first breaking bread how'd you set up that space how'd you get people into the door because that's obviously that's a challenge weeks before the event even starts you know it's, it's a lot like, to put like, so <laughs> <laughs> a whole lot to put that together so when it first happened it wasn't named it was just a an idea it was some things i said during the class that sparked the conversation. So people stayed after class and started discussing these issues and they did not want to leave. People continued to want to talk about the things that were important to them. And folks was like, let's continue to keep these conversations. And we kept doing that. So after class, we would just start having organic conversation. It wasn't designed. And then said, let's put a name to it. And then we did a class and I reached out to Noodles and Company and I asked Noodles and Company if they would be willing to let us occupy their space and they said yeah not only they let us occupy their space but they donated all the food for everyone to eat and that's when we brought in the law enforcement we brought in different members of the community and we started having those conversations and then we had conversations about mental health conversations about many different topics that people were concerned with and bringing people together around immigration you name it we talked about it and those were some of the conversations that we had and they were all pretty challenging. You know, I had to talk to law enforcement. Some pe people I knew, some people I didn't know, and I told them the idea. Some of them were really interested, but they had a higher up that wouldn't allow them to be in part of those conversations. So then there's a lot of resistance and people were like, oh, they don't want to show up. They don't think this is important where they don't really have the, they didn't have that power to be able to say yes and show up because they represent something different that was above them. So there was a lot of red tape in some of these conversations. There was some challenge, but I think there's so many challenges in life, and I think we just, like I said earlier, you just got to keep knocking, and then I kept knocking, and those doors opened up, and they showed up, and we went all the way up to the chief of police showed up. Some of his people showed up, and Aurora showed up, and fire department showed up, first responders showed up, and in some of these conversations, we learned so much. So oftentimes, we think about law enforcement, or we think about the fire department in different ways, and one man from the fire department had showed up, and he broke down and just started crying. We're like, what's going on? Maybe something was said that moved him. I don't know. And then we asked him and he said, I've never been in a space with the community when I actually wasn't saving them. I'm just talking to them. Every time I get up every day, I'm looking at people deal with tragedies and it's starting to take a toll on me. I think those are the things that we have to remember. What are we doing for the people who wake up to this every single day? When they get there, they see bodies being decapitated. They see some of the worst experiences that a person can see. And they go home and they sleep with them. And they wake up and do it again the next day. And he just shared some of those experiences with the crowd. And he silenced the crowd. No one had anything to say because it was something that most people don't even think about. So they just hugged on him and loved on him and want to support him in any way he can. Went and took him fruit bowls and just connected with him in a meaningful way. I think those are the things we need to realize along the way of doing all of this great work. That some people are experiencing great tragedy in the midst of them doing great work and being able to support them also. So the conversation was about law enforcement and community members who may not have the best relationships, but something else grew out of that as well. And those are some of our blind spots that we also like to address. Mm -hmm. I think just feeling like you're being heard, feeling like you're mm -hmm. being loved on, recognizing that everyone's living in this little universe of their own life, yeah. ups, downs, and the struggle of every day mm -hmm. of bettering yourself to keeping your family supported you know we all share this uh, human experience and that's so powerful that just being in the presence of people that care for you and 
serve you a plate of food, give you a hug. That's unbelievable. Hmm. What are your goals for the future of I'm Unique? The mission, the mission is the goal. When you think about creating a culture of health, individual growth, and social change, the only thing that's really sustainable in life, oftentimes we hear this word a lot. Well, I've heard it in my lifetime. I won't say everybody else has, but I've heard this word a lot. And what I think the true sustainability is when the culture of the people actually take on the attributes of a program. So you no longer need the program because the culture exists. Hopefully we can accomplish that with I'm Unique, to where it turns into a culture to where we don't have to facilitate these experiences. It just naturally happens and we continue to evolve and see where we can improve. That's a part of the the goal that I can see right now is just being able to implement these ideas and these principles across the globe and we just take it on to where it's not, it doesn't need a facilitator, it just naturally happens. A paradigm shift, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And so we do films as well. So we had a, a film release. It was called The Untold Stories of STEM. It addressed many different issues in the community and it created a platform for people to speak on issues that they found to be most important. And we continue to do that as well. So we have a, a media outlet arm that people can become more informed about as well. So those are some of the things that the future holds as yeah. of right now. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I saw when I took your class that uh, you had a small crew of kind of your captains, your leaders, you know, and they were helping with the class, but also they seem to be part of your program. Do you offer some sort of kind of like, not say it's like a leadership program, but I'm sure having felt what I felt and what you're explaining right now, people are drawn to it and want to make a change and may want to be more involved in coming to these events. How do you facilitate that? We have a training called the Path Towards Harmony Teacher Training Program to where you become a facilitator and once you become a facilitator, you're classified as a facilitator of harmony. And those are some of the things that we do. So we practice the asana, but we also practice facilitating different discussions wherever your space may be. So, and our training starts off with the people closest to you. So you have to be able to lead them and teach them first and be able to provide information with those in your reach, whether that's your family, your neighbors, your colleagues, your coworkers, whoever's in your space, be able to work with them and then go out into the wider community. Because oftentimes people do great work in the community and you come home and you don't have those great relationships with the people that you're sharing those walls with. And that's a consistent problem I've seen through the years, just seeing people do great work in the community and maybe they're getting a divorce or maybe they haven't been with their kids in so long. And at home, it's not peaceful. It's not well received be able to influence those around you in that way then go into the community so we do have a program and it's uh the path towards harmony and creating that for community members to be engaged with themselves and be engaged with the world around them and that's what we also provide do you find that people seem to come more for the message or is it the yoga i would imagine it would be the message yeah sometimes we we divide things like is it this or is it that and sometimes it's just both. They just complement each other and it makes sense. And I think we gravitate towards things that make sense. It makes it a lot easier in our decision making. So I think there's a part of the asana practice that is very appealing because people like to be physical. And then the message is something that we can all relate to and it can impact everyone's lives. So as we talk about, oh, it's voting season, there's a lot of division around that. Or when something happens in the community, there's a lot of divisions around which side you choose. And being able to make informed decisions, I think, is what helps people get more involved because it's something to where it's really balanced and it does its best to be objective when we look at information and evaluate information. And I think that approach allows people to want to come in because wherever they lie on the spectrum, they have a place to. I've always found that you find connection and you have more long lasting relationships with people that you share some sort of trying experience with. Yoga is such low hanging fruit when it comes to that, right? A lot of people, it's just finding your body's edges, its limits, maybe pushing those barriers a little bit and just that exercise alone, it opens the heart a bit. Mm. Combine that with a message like yourself, like that you provide, and it's a fantastic experience, man. Thank you. For those who are young in these divided communities, I mean, which in my eyes is just everyone, you mm. know, no matter where, where you are in life, it seems that there is some sort of division in these communities. What would you encourage to the younger folks coming up to 
kind of extend an olive branch, if you will? That's a really good question and a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer. I think, I think you might have a little bit of insight to it. It's a great question because I think it's something we should be thinking about. But when we when we look at it for the whole, I think it's different for every individual person. So I've seen people who went to try to extend their hands to people who didn't receive it. And it makes it challenging for that person to continue to keep reaching. That rejection can be really deterring. Absolutely. So that's why I really talk about like being able to develop yourself first and being able to strengthen your emotional intelligence so you can deal with the no's and the rejections that you talked about because you're going to see that along the way. And I have to re refer back to a story. I was having a conversation with a man by the name of Don Cheeto. He uh, went to uh, Denver East, right? Went to East, Iron Man, big time actor. And in this conversation, the question was asked, what would you say to a young actor or actress who wants to pursue a career in that field? And he says, I would tell them don't do it. Go get a degree, go to college and get an education because people are going to judge you, people are going to critique you, people are going to tell you you're not good enough. Why would you put yourself in that position? And in this area of social media, people are always going to criticize you and put all these nasty things about you online. And it's gonna be a lot to deal with. Why would you do that to yourself? But if you get an education, you get a degree, you have something to fall back on, you have something to provide for your family, and that's gonna make your path a lot easier. And then he ended with this, but if that stops you, then it really wasn't meant for you. Because there's nothing that I should be able to say to get you to not want to accomplish your goals and your dreams because it's in your heart. Then there should be no one who can tell you to do otherwise. But I'm just going to prepare you for the world that you're going to be involved in. And I think that's something that we all have to remember along the way that we're all gonna be critiqued, we're all gonna be criticized, we're all gonna be told we're not good enough. But those things should not stop us if it's really in our heart because eventually those doors will open up and we will make a way for ourselves if we continue on the path. And if not, then we're going to be easily distracted and discouraged along the way if we can't deal with the criticism that we're gonna also be a part of. So that's advice that I would also share because I think that's something that we have to think about when we want to pursue our own greatness is that that's a part of the journey as well. That's the part of the process as well. And let's not create an illusion that it's going to be easy. And I think when you have that already in your, your viewpoint, then it's going to be a lot easier. So when it shows up, you're already familiar with it. You're already saying, Oh, I know that this was going to happen. I can sit down and have coffee with that. I can have tea with that. I'm not afraid of that. And I can get real familiar with what I'm not, comfortable with and I think that's going to make it a lot better for anyone trying to pursue anything in life well put <laughs> I 100% agree with you I very much live in this world of um, rejection versus regret hmm. and every time I feel that the rejection is far greater than the regret hmm. yet the regret is kind of the path of least resistance in a lot of ways right to be like well this person said that it wasn't good enough, so maybe I should call quits today. And kind of losing your own true north from the opinions of others, right? And I think that that has kind of, on a macro level, caused a lot of people to play it safe, right? And to stay in this bubble of, you know, I put out a, a challenging photo maybe, and, you know, I'll see, how, like, I'll test the waters a little <laughs> bit. But I, the idea of going out there and being an actor and having something to say every day is terrifying but what's the outcome you know what is the safe bet to get a job that kind of has a ceiling that doesn't really go anywhere to always when those butterflies come up to kind of hold back and you know be like oh no not now not this time maybe the motivation will come next week or the week after that it's so important to realize that this is our only shot you know we're up to bat we're taking swings yeah. you know you just keep watching the balls pass by you're gonna start swinging at them so it's really inspiring to chat with you, Tyrone, and hearing how how you saw that vision and how you've taken swings at life, too. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I know we've got a, a stop coming up, but I wanted to thank you so much for being a part of this. If you wouldn't mind, I uh, will get off the air, and then maybe if you wouldn't mind doing a reading for us, I'd really appreciate that. Just mainly for my own, <laughs> 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 my own uh, nostalgia and enjoyment, but... Thanks so much, man. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they're looking to get involved with I'm Unique or Tyrone Beverly? You can go to I'mUnique.org 
or Tyrone Beverly on Facebook, or uh, our Instagram is I'm Unique as well. So it's I'm Unique, the Illustrated Union Yoga Tour on Facebook also, and Karma Tuesdays, so you can connect with us on Tuesdays, or you can create your own experience wherever you are in space, and being able to create impact in someone else's life. And then we have film options as well, if you want to be a part of some of the films that we have coming up, you have some ideas around some issues you think aren't getting enough exposure, we would love to discuss that with you as well. So those are some of the easiest ways to connect with us, though, either on our Facebook, our Twitter account, or our website, which is omunique.org. All right. <laughs> All right. Tyrone, thanks so much for being on the Mind Mill. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the interview. And now, The Poetic Flow by Tyrone Beverly. So this here is the uh, poetic flow, and it's a it's a declaration to the practice and the cultivation of who you are as a human being. Oftentimes we practice yoga and we think about up dog, down dog, but what's the message that we're saying with it? So this came to be when you think about the statement that's been said with your body. So that's what the poetic flow is really all about. It's about the embodiment of nature and the characteristics, but it's also about making a statement with the way that you move and how you move and what you're moving towards. So here's the poetic flow. I embody the strength of a mountain. Is what I want you to remember. I am connected to a collective awakening of self-discovery and mastery. Movement is medicine. I calculate my movement by my daily regimen. I stand on the shoulder of our ancestors and continue the path towards harmony. I reach for the knowledge above me and honor the knowledge within. I embody the strength of a mountain. I am a warrior too. I reverse my path back to harmony. I extend myself to peace. I rise like an eagle, peaceful and free. But I can only see half the moon. But like Jiva, this is the immortal essence of living. I reassign my energy and bow to a better me. The same way I come in is the same way I come out. But yet, something's different. Physically, spiritually, and mentally. And that is me. I experience life between the earth and the sky. I bend and fold and unfold to reveal my truth because it's written from within. And no matter what I go through in life, I will rise and rise and rise again. I push up so I don't get pushed down. I lunge into my daily routine. My intention is to live by a code of honor and acknowledge everything in between. I push up so I don't get pushed down. I lunge into my daily routine and my intention is to live by code of honor and acknowledge everything in between. I push up so I don't get pushed down. My intention is to move with precision, balance like a crane on a mission. One leg forward before I speak, I listen. Because when I listen, I learn. Balance like a crane on a mission. One leg forward doesn't have to be faster. In life, it is not a mistake. It is yet to be mastered. It's a part of the poetic flow. It's not the whole thing. We'll be here all day. So that's just a piece of it. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the Mindful Millennial Podcast. If you loved this episode, check out some of the other Mind Mill episodes. They're all free and available at themindmill.com and on all the major podcast platforms. Also, please, please, please take a second and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's incredibly easy and it really is the best way to help the show. Stay tuned for more Mind Mill episodes coming down the line. I'll keep them interesting for you, I promise. Take it easy. Today's episode is sponsored by Best Self, makers of the Self Journal and other phenomenal productivity and mindfulness tools. At the start of 2017, I had New Year's goals like so many of us. However, having just turned 30, I wanted something different. I wanted to actually achieve my goals, not kick ass in January, followed by the quick decline back to where I started, which inherently feels worse than when I started. I decided writing my goals and recording my progress is the best way to stay the course. 
I had always wanted to journal regularly, but like many of us, the phobia of the blank page was enough to keep me kicking the can down the road. The self-journal was different, however. Unlike a traditional journal, the self-journal is a 13-week goal-oriented planner journal. It's designed to teach the user to set a tangible goal, break it down into achievable tasks, and work every day towards completion. The journal also includes areas for gratitude and reflection, plus notes and scheduling. So I took a chance. I got my journal and committed to the 13-week program. The outcome was greater than I could ever have imagined. The ironic thing was, I didn't achieve my first goals. However, what I did achieve was the ability to actually see my progress, what I was avoiding, and what to do next. I could actually give myself a grade on my work, not this pass-fail bullshit mentality we seem to judge our lives by. My productivity skyrocketed, along with my routines and overall happiness. I found myself able to focus on the moment, the present, rather than reliving the past or anxiously anticipating the future. If I thought of something, I now had a place to unload it from my mind. Fast forward a year, and I'm now on my fourth journal. What started as a scary new addition to my busy day has become one of my most useful tools. I can look back on this pivotal year of my life, see how far I've come, know where I'm at, and what lies ahead. So check it out. Join the thousands of people who have had their lives radically improved with the assistance of Best Self. Check out bestself.co for all the journal options and other amazing productivity tools. Or follow the link in the episode show notes to support the Mindful Millennial podcast. It's all available there.